Hey friends, this is the Mrs. Wolfie from our Half Acre Homestead. Excuse me, it's 5.30 in the morning. And goat's milked and Howie's off to work and the bread's out of the oven. I'm not going to rant today. Well, I am kind of, but <clears throat> I've written some stuff down because sometimes when I go on a rant it's usually over an article I've read and and I've got the article in front of me but this is kind of this is some clarification on some previous rants and I've written it down just so that I am clear so if you see me looking down it's because I, I'm reading I don't want you to miss my point okay so I'm not going to rant today I just want to share some thoughts with you on some previous rants to start with my rants are usually about something I've read that has upset me or made me shake my head at the gullibility of a good portion of today's society. Uh, I'm not an expert, folks. You know, when I rant, I don't always have all the facts. Or I do have the, what I think are the facts and, and it's something I've read off the internet. What you're seeing is what I'm feeling, okay? And just because something is possible does not always mean it's going to happen. For instance, cybrids. Uh, the human embryos that are going to be grown that are genetically modified by adding animal DNA. For starters, those embryos are supposed to be destroyed after 14 weeks when the stem cells have been harvested for research. That doesn't make it okay. Not in my book. Does that mean they will never go beyond the 14 week stage? I doubt it. If they did allow an embryo to grow to the stage of viable life, would we ever be able to tell the difference by looking at that person? Can you tell the difference between organic and GMO corn just by looking at it? Will it ever get to that stage? God, I hope not. But it has been my experience and history teaches us that what man creates through science will eventually be pushed to the limits of its possibilities. Once a precedent has been set, that means there's a toe in the door that may later be pushed wide open. Just look at Crisco. The fat that started out supposedly for soap ended up as the first imitation food instead. We didn't know that partially hydrogenated oils in Crisco, the trans fatty acids, were bad for us. In fairness, Procter and G to Procter and Gamble, they didn't know this either. Not at first. But when reports of problems began to appear, problems like increased heart disease, increased cancer, growth problems, learning disorders, and infertility, P&G worked behind the scenes to cover them up. One scientist who worked for P&G, Dr. Fred Matson, can be credited with, the, with presenting the U.S. government's inconclusive lipid research clinic trials to the public as proof that animal fats caused heart disease. He was also one of the baleful influences that persuaded the American Heart Association to preach the phony gospel of the lipid hypothesis. The truth about the dangers of trans fatty acids in foods like Crisco is finally emerging. But the precedent was set for imitation food. Thanks to that toe in the door, we now have things like MSG, aspartame, propyl gallate, BHA, BHT, potassium bromate, and many other unpronounceable chemicals that the food industry says are acceptable levels of toxins. What about genetically modified food? How was a chemical company capable of patenting genetic material to the point where they control over 90% of corn, soya, beans and sugar beets grown in North America today and that 90% is genetically modified. How did that happen? Well a precedent was set in the 1980s. A microbiologist working for GE at the time had created an organism, a genetically engineered bacterium with the capability of breaking down crude oil. He had filed three patents on the project, one patent in particular to claim the rights for the organism he created. Unfortunately, this was not seen fit as the typical view inferred by 35 U.S.C. 101 was that living things are not patentable. However, the decision was overturned because the 
because the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals considered Chakrabarty's organism to be manufactured. They had to decide no importance was held legally in the fact that the microorganism is living. The case of Diamond versus Chakrabarty led to the first ever patent held on a living organism. Chakrabarty's patent for this genetically engineered microorganism opened the door for gene patenting. Remember that toe in the door I mentioned? That is what happens, that is what happened when a chemical company took that precedent and shoved that door wide open. What about the United Nations Agenda 21? Section 2, the conservation and management of resources for development. Number 14, promoting sustainable agriculture and rural development. 16, environmentally sound management of biotechnology. 17, protections of the oceans, all kinds of seas, including enclosed and semi-enclosed areas and coastal areas and the protection and rational use and development of their living resources. Protection of the quality and supply of fresh water resources, application of integrated approaches to the development, management and use of water resources. Environmentally sound management of toxic chemicals including prevention of illegal international traffic in toxic and dangerous products. Now that all sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But that's a double-edged sword. They say protection, then they say development. And there's a big difference between protection and development. That's a double-edged sword. But my question is, if this is what they are proposing and enforcing, why? Why is companies like Monsanto, Dow Chemicals, Pioneer, why are they exempt? Why are they exempt? As of 2011, U.S. farmers were applying 150 million pounds of Roundup to 100 million acres of cropland every year. Do you have any idea what that does to the soil and the groundwater? This is a closed environment, folks. This, this shit doesn't go away. It just gets recycled back into our environment. But if they're protecting it, why are these guys getting away with poisoning our, our, our land and water and soil? Now, let's talk about the plague of illnesses that have skyrocketed over the last hundred years. And I mean skyrocketed. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, cancer was some, you know, vague and and uh, mysterious disease that happened to one maybe you may have heard of one person who a friend of a friend of a friend who had lung cancer from smoking nowadays it's like every third person you know or almost everyone you know has been touched by cancer so let's talk about the these illnesses that have skyrocketed over the last hundred years cancer diabetes heart disease thyroid malfunction the list is endless what are we told is the answer to all these ills? More chemicals. Chemical medications. Chemically coated and laden vitamins. Treatments that blast our already blasted systems with more chemicals. Take the nutrition out of the food and replace it with chemically laden supplements and medications. That's their, that's their answer. But what has changed? What has changed in the last hundred years to bring about all these these physical health changes our food even most of the meat we eat has been fed genetically modified feed at one point or another if not its whole life this didn't happen overnight folks kids didn't just suddenly get fat by eating the wrong foods and playing video games the food chain has been changed modified toxified over the last hundred years. We're talking about people who have had their diets modified by the food industry over two to three generations. And most of those modifications were sold to us as healthy changes. Things like aspartame and shit like or crap like that. Our kids just didn't suddenly get obese, ill, and lazy. 
They were born genetically and chemically predisposed to it. Now having said all this, you ask, what is to be done? Well, for starters, something that's been, been in the making for over a hundred years does not change overnight. And unless you're wealthy, going completely organic is a difficult task. But it's not hopeless. It's not. The cure starts with us. We vote how we want to be treated by industry every time we shop. When we buy GMO corn, soy, or sugar products, and we all do, even I do, we vote every time we buy GMO seed for our gardens or feed for our animals, every time we use chemicals in our homes or on our gardens. Am I saying change everything you do? No. I, cer I certainly can't afford to have everything organic the way I would like it. But I do whenever I can. I plant organic. I don't use pesticides or other chemicals on my garden. What I am saying when you do when you can make one change just one one voice may one voice alone may not be heard but add it to the voice of many and that voice becomes a roar i have posted links below in the show more box as always i encourage you to do your research weigh your choices listen to your instincts don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. This is the Mrs. Wolfie from our Half Acre Homestead saying the truth is out there. Look for it. Find it. Use it. And stand by it. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, tonight is the Homestead Honey Hour. Today is uh, uh, March 14th, 2013. And tonight, um, we have a special guest, Rob States, who, um, the, the, uh, gentleman on, who, the gentleman in the video, The Dark Sides of Smart Meters. And that's what our topic is tonight. So, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, I believe, or Central. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, at PrepperBroadcasting.com. We'll see you there. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.